Chapter 5. Cells are the basic unit of life. There are a lot of different types of cells. For example, there are plant cells, and plant cells form a multicellular organism. Right here you're looking at Elodea leaves, and the cells are actually the large rectangular structures. Those small green balls in there are the chloroplasts, and those are the site where photosynthesis takes place. There are also many different types of single-celled organisms as well, like this paramecium in the middle, or diatoms on the right. But regardless of whether or not you're a single-celled organism or a multicellular organism like a plant or an animal, the cell is a basic unit of life. So even when we look at like a dragonfly, which is a multicellular animal, it is made up of lots of different types of cells. Over time, we develop something called cell theory. And cell theory just basically states that cells are the basic unit of life. And these small cells here are actually mine. They're from my cheek. The second part of cell theory is that all cells come from pre-existing cells, or at least in today's world they do. So of course, at one point when cells emerged from geological processes over 3.8 billion years ago, the first cells on the earth didn't come from pre-existing cells. But ever since life got started, they have. The first cells on the planet were similar to modern bacteria. One thing about modern bacteria, they're everywhere. I mean everywhere. And in fact, they are so numerous on this planet. They live in the soil, they live in and on you, and they outnumber you 10 to 1. So what I'm saying to you is that the bacteria living in your body and on your skin, for every one cell that is you, there are approximately 10 bacteria cells. So you have over 100 trillion bacteria living in and on you. Bacteria in the soil. If you take a handful of soil, just one little handful from your garden, there is more bacteria in that soil than there have been people that have ever existed on this planet or have ever lived. Not only that, the diversity of that bacterial community in that soil could be greater than all the birds in North America, which is about a thousand different types or more. We haven't even really figured out how many there are yet. Life began in the ocean sometime around 3.8 billion years ago, and it began as simply as it could. And it came through a process called abiogenesis. A means without, bio means life, genesis means start. So abiogenesis means the start of life. And life actually evolved in the, as an extension of geological processes. And what you're looking at here is something called the lost city. It's a hydrothermal vent in the bottom of the ocean in the middle of the Atlantic. And it's a vent like this that may have led to the origins of life approximately 3.8 billion years ago. Life almost certainly got started one time on this planet. It may have gotten started earlier, and it may have gotten started multiple times, but those other experiments with life almost certainly did not make it. What I'm saying to you is that all the modern life today, every plant, animal, and bacteria, all came from a single common ancestor that emerged from probably a hydrothermal vent about 3.8 billion years ago. That is important because the single origin of life explains all the similarities between plants and animals and bacteria. We affectionately call that last universal common ancestor LUCA. What you're looking at is a phylogenetic tree of life. What that shows you is all the relationships between the bacteria and archaea. Those are two different types of prokaryotes to all the eukaryotes. And you look on this and you notice that animals plants and fungi, the things that we're most familiar with only represent tiny little branch points on the tree of life. What that means is that the bacteria are incredibly diverse, that archaea are also diverse, 
and the eukaryotes are diverse as well. And when you think about plants, animals, and fungi being one little branch, it means that despite all the variation in life we see as animals, at the cellular level, we're actually fairly closely related, and that's because we have common ancestry. The first cells on the planet were prokaryotes, and that makes sense. They are more structurally simple than a eukaryotic cell. Now, prokaryotes include two domains, the bacteria and the archaea. And what you're looking at on the right are E. coli. And those E. coli are very similar to the ones that you find in your gut. Because all life shares a common ancestor to that LUCA, the last universal common ancestor, we share things in common. And one of the things we share in common with plants, fungus, and bacteria is that we have a cellular membrane made of a phospholipid bilayer. And if you're not remembering what a phospholipid bilayer is, go back to chapter four and look at lipids. But the point here is that every single cell on this planet is surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer, which forms the cellular membrane. Also, inside of the phospholipid bilayer or the cellular membrane, there's a cytoplasm. All cells have cytoplasm and it's basically a source of water and minerals. All cells contain DNA and RNA. And as you know, DNA contains the information of life and RNA is an intermediate involved with the making of proteins. RNA is a quite remarkable and versatile molecule. But all life has these two nucleic acids. Perhaps some of the best evidence of a single common ancestor is that life uses the same genetic code. We all use the same four nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. You can think of those as letters, but they also form words called a codon. And a codon is just three nucleotides and they code for an amino acid. And the genetic code is the same for every living organism on this planet, almost. What that means is if I've got a gene to make insulin in humans, I can put that gene in a bacteria and that bacteria can read that gene and make insulin. Likewise, I can pull a gene out of a tree or a bacteria, put it in us, and it will work. And the reason why is because the genetic code evolved with the first life forms 3.8 billion years ago, and it's been evolving, well, it hasn't really evolved, but it's been passed down ever since largely unchanged. Another feature that all cells have in common, they have ribosomes and ribosomes make proteins. So every single protein in this world was made by a ribosome. And here's an example of a ribosome making it. There's a green area and a kind of a beige area. Those are the two subunits of the ribosome. We'll talk more about that later. That black string-like thing, this kind of curved, that is the messenger RNA. And those blue things coming in and out, those are transfer RNAs. And you can see the protein or the polypeptide is slowly growing as amino acids are added to it. And then this is now where the ribosome is actually attaching to the rough ER to make a protein inside the rough ER. And that's something we'll talk about when we get to the endomembrane system. And we know that life uses the same genetic code. So of course, if we're using the same genetic code, we use the same 20 amino acids. So when you eat a piece of spinach, that plant is using the same 20 amino acids that I use or you. And here they are. You can see this chart of all the different amino acids. And don't forget, the amino acids come in handedness. They have chirality. There's right-handed forms and left-handed forms. And all the amino acids in the world are left-handed. Let's review the similarities of all cells. Basically, they have a cellular membrane made of phospholipids. They all have a cytoplasm and they use DNA and RNA with the same nucleotides. The genetic code is nearly universal. We inherited it from our last common ancestor. And we all use ribosomes to make proteins. And to make those proteins, all life uses basically the same 20 left-handed amino acids.